Hey y'all, welcome to Sandy's Library. I'm Sandy, and in this video series, I'm going to read another one of my books for y'all. Just as a quick reminder, this is not a professional production. It's just an author reading her book. So, let's get started. The Lonely Hearts Club, Southern Charmers, Book 2, Copyright 2015. Written in red by Sandra Edwards, Chapter 1. Georgia. The best thing about flying first class is you get to get on and off the plane first. I'm the impatient sort, so I like this. My twin sister Ginger, on the other hand, likes to be indulged. Most people would be surprised to learn that the pampering isn't my main motive for flying first class, since they all think I'm a spoiled diva anyway. Only my closest friends, Ginger, Dana, Malibu, only they know the real me. My name is Georgia Franklin. That's the name I was born with. I've never been married, never even come close. I gave my heart away a long time ago. So there's no use in pretending I could give it away to someone else now. I'm a singer-songwriter and a pretty famous one at that. If I were half the diva that most people think I am, I'd have my own airplane, which I could totally afford. Just don't bring that up to my sister, Ginger. She enjoys helping me find ways to spend my money. The last leg of our flight from New Orleans to Cypress Falls was a far cry from first class. You see, my hometown's airport is too small to accommodate a jet large enough to offer first-class travel. Cypress Falls is a sleepy little town north of Baton Rouge that sits on the Louisiana side of the Mississippi River, and I haven't been there in 25 years. If you asked me, even a year ago, if I'd ever returned to Cypress Falls, I would have given you a big, fat, emphatic no. But that was before the notion ever came to me that my niece Lisa might one day get married. So, there I was, sitting on this little commuter jet with Ginger and our friend Malibu Drake, heading to a wedding that's either going to heal a lot of wounds or split them wide open. Our cramped and thankfully short flight to Cypress Falls ended quickly and I had mixed feelings about it. I was glad to get off the small plane but it also meant I was that much closer to facing the music. <clears throat> Inside the terminal we sent Malibu off to wait for our luggage by the baggage carousel while Ginger followed me to the car rental counter. The girl at the car rental place greeted us with a happy smile as she asked, How can I help you? Her southern accent was thick and drawn out and I found comfort in it somehow. I gave the girl my printed reservation hoping that someone as young as she wouldn't recognize me. I didn't want to deal with a crowd, not today. I've got a car reserved, I said, thankful there was no recognition lighting the girl's eyes. I already had a big enough monkey on my back. I was heading back to a town where practically everybody hated me. Ginger elbowed me, asking, what kind of car did you get? Ferrari? Porsche? Ordinarily, this kind of banter from Ginger wouldn't bother me, but today was no ordinary day, and I just wasn't in the mood. I said, no, Ginger, we're getting a plain old sedan. What? Ginger squealed. I'm serious, I said, in my best grown-up voice. No, 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 Ginger said, shaking her head. Don't you get it? She asked. You've got a reputation to uphold. Can't make your big return in an average rental car. I laughed. I'm serious, Georgia. 
Ginger frowned at me. If we show up in a regular old car, everybody's going to say, What's the matter? George broke. You know that's what they're going to say. She nodded, trying to egg me on. They're all going to say you're broke and you failed. I rolled my eyes and shook my head. Nobody was going to believe I was broke. Forbes reports my income annual, annually, whether I like it or not. After I signed the rental agreement, the girl handed me a copy along with a key fob. I thanked her and stuffed my wallet back inside my purse. We stepped away from the counter and Ginger asked, Can I drive? I ignored Ginger as we made our way toward the baggage carousel. That's the best thing to do. Ignore her. Answering her, whether it be negative or positive, only seems to fuel the fire. Malibu was standing by the carousel, which wasn't moving with his arms crossed at his chest. He glanced at us with a look that said he was rethinking his decision to join us on this trip. You might be wondering why a big star such as myself, and I say that lightheartedly, would be standing around waiting for luggage. Yep, there are delivery services for that. But I've got to be careful about handing out my parents' address to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes along. Malibu grumbled. How can it take this long to unload the baggage? He asked. What's the passenger capacity of that plane we were on? One hundred? A hundred? <laughs> With no first class and only three seats per row? I doubted it. One thing you've got to learn about the South, Malibu is, Ginger told him. Everything moves at a leisurely pace. Then I don't want to live here he said. I figured he was kidding. But one never knows with Malibu. He likes his money. And Lord knows people down here aren't going to pay his exorbitant L.A. prices for party planning. The thing that throws most people off about Malibu is that, generally speaking, male events planners, out in L.A. anyway, are gay. But not Malibu. Carousel started moving, and we all got excited. Ginger said, good, now maybe we can get out of here sometime today. It was like she picked her statement straight out of my head. I've been told that's the thing with twins. They each have a tendency to say what the other is thinking. I knew that was true, at least as far as Ginger and I were concerned. Yeah, but, I chuckled, our bags will be the last ones off. That's the way my luck tended to run. So tell me about your sister, Malibu elbowed Ginger. The one I'm supposed to lay a little charm on? Don't be obvious, Malibu, Ginger said in a tone she typically reserved for her kids, Justin and Diana. We just want you to be nice to her. I flirt with her a little. Ginger continued trying to convince Malibu to give Risa a little bit of her groove back, and I let my eyes roam over the new airport terminal. It was glossy and shiny and brand new, barely a year old from what Ginger had told me. I, for one, was glad I didn't have to step back in time into that old and worn-out terminal with its 70s style paneling and egg crate ceiling. And the smell. Ginger had said the smell was like our Aunt Kate's house when we were kids. You know, that old people's smell. <clears throat> there are a lot of things about Cypress Falls that I'd missed over the years, but the smell of Aunt Kate's house wasn't one of them. Malibu hauled our suitcases off the conveyor belt, and I grabbed the handle on mine, extending it. We plowed through the crowd, milling around the baggage claim area, and headed for the exit. The glass doors slid open, and heat and humidity swelled around us as we stepped outside. 
It brought with it a whole slew of memories that hadn't made it to the surface of my brain in a very long time. Tommy Dixon pushing me in the swing before I was old enough to go to school. Mom and Daddy taking us kids to the movies and then to the A&W for root beer floats. The look on Reese's face when she found out I was going to California, even though she decided to stay behind with Mike and the rest of the band. The last time I saw my older sister, she had watery eyes and a scowl on her face because Mike had convinced her that I had ruined it for the rest of the band. It broke my heart that Risa believed things would have turned out differently for the band if I'd turned down the record company's deal. Hell, if I'd done that, I'd probably be working at the Piggly Wiggly right now. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's nothing wrong with being a world-famous singer-songwriter either. Outside, on this muggy, late-summer Louisiana day, we searched the small rental car parking lot for stall number four, where we'd been promised we'd find our car. As we strolled along, I handed the keys to Ginger. Let's face it, she likes to drive, and I'm tired of it. As promised, in stall number four, we found our car, a brand new dark gray BMW. Back in the terminal, I'd let Ginger talk me into the upgrade. Not that I believed any part of her reasoning. Nobody was going to believe I was broke. But sometimes, it's easier to give in to Ginger, so she'll shut up. In my early days of fame, I drove a Ferrari. And in my 30s, I switched to a Jaguar. When I hit 40, a couple of years ago, I was captivated by the new Dodge Challenger. It's worth far less than its predecessors, but it's oh so retro cool, and it makes me happy. These days, I like to keep things around me that make me happy. After Malibu stuffed our bags into the Beamer's trunk, we piled into the car. Malibu tried to call a shotgun, but I overruled him since I was paying the bill. I'd be lying if I said that driving on the streets of Cypress Falls for the first time in 25 years wasn't stirring some old feelings and emotions, mainly to do with what ifs and a bit of melancholy. I suspected all along that something like this would happen once I got here. But it didn't make reality any easier to cope with. Hey, I said, pointing against the window. Isn't that where the A&W used to be? There was a jiffy lube there now. Yeah, Ginger's tone was unusually quiet. I glanced at her, feeling a bit dismal. Look at they tear down the A&W. It was as much a part of our childhood as the town itself. We'd spent many a summer day hiking down there long before we could drive to score some soft serve ice cream. As we grew into teenagers, it was a favorite gathering place on Friday and Saturday nights where we'd grab a bite to eat and then make plans to meet at the bowling alley or the pool hall or the moon tower or even down by the river. I know it doesn't sound like much by today's standards, but back then it sure brought us joy. How could they do that? I asked softly. I wanted to go by the Jiffy Lube and the land it sits on and restore it to its former glory. Ginger's cell phone buzzed against the cubby under the radio where she placed it when she got in the car. I grabbed it since she was driving. I looked at the display, and without hesitating, I answered the call. Mama, I said into the phone. I think my voice even cracked a little. See, I'm a mama's girl, and I was counting on my mother to shield me from the townspeople who were still carrying a grudge against me. Georgia, she asked with a measure of uncertainty. 
I could picture Mama questioning herself about whose phone she'd actually called. Yes, Mama, I said. It's me. Ginger's driving. I put Mama on speaker. You're here then, she asked, regaining her composure. Could you girls stop by the store for me? Sure, Mama. I looked at Ginger, who was shaking her head and making a neck-cutting gesture, waved her off and said to the phone, What do you need? Mama said, I need coconut milk and cream cheese. An odd combination for sure, but I knew exactly what it meant. Oh, Mommy, are you making a coconut cake? I asked, practically reverting back to the age of ten. Yuck, the one word grated out on Ginger's voice. For as much as I loved my mother's coconut cake, my twin sister hated it equally. Yes, dear, Mama said. If she'd heard Ginger, she wasn't saying. Instead, she concentrated on me. I know it's your favorite, and I want your homecoming to be special. No worries, Mama, I said. We'll get the stuff you need. I chuckled as I hung up the phone and looked at Ginger. I said, oh man, Mama's coconut cake. I haven't had a decent one in ages. I can hardly wait. Ginger shuddered out a displeased groan and said, you can have my share. <clears throat> Does she make it with fresh or packaged coconut? Malibu asked from the back seat. I hadn't said much since we piled into the car. But who wants to get in the middle of me and Ginger when we get going? I glanced over my shoulder and said, My mother? Packaged coconut? Bet your tongue, Malibu. Ginger started shaking her head and laughing. Don't dare mention packaged coconut to our mother. God forbid. We drove past the Walmart. It'd take a month to get in and out of there. Instead, we went on to a fairly new grocery store that had been erected at the site of the old Piggly Wiggly. I was hardly able to accept that they torn down yet another place that was so attached to my childhood memories. By the time we pulled into the new grocery store's parking lot, I was practically lost. I hadn't recognized a damn thing since we'd left the airport. Nothing looked familiar to me. In just 25 years, my home had become unrecognizable. But I guess I had no one to blame but myself. I looked at Ginger, who just shifted into park. You go in, I said. Me, she replied. I'm not the one she's baking the cake for. You go in. Just as I was about to raise an argument, Ginger's cell phone chimed. She glanced at the phone and looked up at me and began pointing between me and the store. As Ginger answered her phone, I glanced over my shoulder at Malibu. No way, he said, shaking his head. Fine, I said in my best haughty voice. I latched onto the handle and opened the car door. I'll be back, I said, climbing out. I slammed the door and headed inside. As I made my way through the store, I could feel a few people's gazes lingering on me a little longer than they probably looked at other folks. But nobody approached me. I'm not sure if that made me nervous or thankful. I wasn't used to people just staring. People liked talking to me. And usually, I enjoyed that. But with Cypress Falls, I just wasn't sure what I was in for. The cream cheese was easy to locate. And after a few hit and misses with aisles, I found the coconut milk. With two cans of milk in one hand and a package of cream cheese in the other, I headed for the cashier. By the time I laid my items on the conveyor belt, I was feeling pretty confident that no one in the store bore me any ill will. And it made sense. I mean, geez, it had been 25 years. Hopefully, even recent Mike's grudge had lightened. Well, 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 the cashier, a woman in her mid to late thirties, gave me a quick once-over that ended with a grin as she said, Would you look at what the cat dragged in? Her voice was nice enough and it set me at ease. I shrugged and said, It's been a while. She dragged my items across the scanner, bagged them, and looked back at me. That'll be 748. 
I dug into my wallet and came out with a 10. You know, she said, handing me my change. You've got a lot of nerve coming back here. Pardon me? I responded with a bit of shock. Hell, this woman didn't even know me. I certainly hadn't done anything to her. After what you did to your sister and all your friends, her tone had grown noticeably tart and it bit into the fears I'd been harboring all these years. You should be ashamed of yourself. That last bit rubbed me the wrong way. I don't know what you've heard, I said with a shrug as I reached for my bag of groceries, but I can assure you it's not the whole story. I gave her a practiced smile and walked away. Outside, I climbed back into the car and rode the rest of the way to my parents' house in silence. I simply stared out the window as we passed several streets where nothing was familiar but their names. I was starting to dislike this whole concept of coming home again. So far, there was nothing about this newfangled Cypress Falls that even remotely resembled my Cypress Falls. And if that wasn't bad enough, apparently everybody, including people that I didn't even know, still hated me. Chapter 2 Ginger No, I said to my son, you and your sister had better be on that airplane when it arrives in Cypress Falls Friday evening. I scolded him in my best authoritative voice. It used to work on both my kids when they were younger. But now that Diana's 18 and Justin's 17, it doesn't work so well these days. It's my own damn fault that my kids don't want to come home to their cousin's wedding. I didn't bring them here enough when they were little. I was just too busy making a name for myself. I'm not famous like Georgia, or nearly as rich, but I've done okay for myself as an entertainment attorney. My name is Ginger Franklin. Upon occasion, I've been referred to as the Queen of Serial Brides. But let me tell you, if I could find a good man who also makes my bell ring, I'd gladly give up my crown. By the time I'd pretty much finished reading my son the riot act, I saw Georgia coming out of the store, so I ended the call. I wasn't sure what had happened to my sister on her shopping excursion, but when she came back to the car, she had clammed up tighter than a rat's ass in a keyhole. She stayed that way until we got to the house, where I guided the car down the long, now paved lane and parked at the front door. Georgia looked at me and asked softly, Do you think Reese is here? I shrugged. I hadn't a clue. Reese didn't live here anymore. Hadn't in years. And I couldn't imagine her running over to welcome Georgia home, the sister she blamed for all that had gone wrong in her life. I don't know, I shook my head. But whether it be today or tomorrow, you will see her again. Sooner, I said with a shrug, rather than later. Seriously, Malibu said from the back seat. She still can't be holding a grudge after all these years. I had to laugh at that. We come from a long line of grudge holders, Malibu. Hell, this whole town is built on grudge holders. Georgia flung open her car door and rolled out. Looking down at the pavement beneath her feet, she asked, When did they do this? I got out of the car and strolled around to where Georgia was still looking at the pavement. I said, long ass time ago, as I hit the trunk button on the key fob, a lot of things had changed since Georgia went away, including our parents' driveway. It was no longer dirt. I went to the back of the car where Malibu was being the perfect gentleman as he was already hauling our luggage out of the trunk. We all grabbed what was ours, extended the handles, and lugged them toward the house. We had a tearful reunion with Mom and Daddy before we could get inside. I'm sure the neighbors enjoyed it. It wouldn't be 
a bit surprised to see a photographic account of it in tomorrow's paper. I can just see the caption now. Singing sensation Georgia Franklin shares a poignant moment with her parents after returning to Cypress Falls for the first time in 25 years. Malibu and I probably wouldn't even be mentioned. Once inside the house, Mother pulled me off to the side, which was a little weird. Georgia was her pet, always had been. That was no secret. Ginger, Mother addressed me in a stern tone as she asked, is Malibu your guest or your sister's? I looked at her. Opportunities like this didn't come along every day. I wasn't going to let this one slip by. I said, he's here with both of us, mother. What? She wailed as her hand flew to her chest and her mouth dropped open. I could see her face turning red. She was thinking the worst of us. Sometimes... I think Mother believes all that stuff she reads in those trash magazines. It was time to put her out of her misery. Mother, calm down. Malibu is our friend, nothing more. She studied me for a moment, probably weighing the odds of whether or not I was lying. Once she got over that and gave me the benefit of the doubt, I could see it in her eyes when she began to rationalize what friend actually meant. She asked is he a homosexual? No, mother. I practically bit my tongue and added, not that it matters. Well, of course it doesn't matter, she said, all indignant. I just like to know who's staying in my house. Fair enough. Before my mother had a chance to really stick her foot in her mouth, the kitchen door opened, and out came a short, chubby woman of about 40 with blonde hair coiffed to the nines. Mother threw her an agitated glance and then pasted on a weak smile. Girls, she sighed, looked at Jen Georgia first, then me, before adding, This is Velma Dickerson. Who? Braced through my thoughts. Mama, George said softly, you taking in boarders now? Mother let out an exasperated chuckle, shook her head and said, No. Velma is here to help out around the house until after the wedding. Doing what? I almost laughed out loud. Don't be rude, Ginger dear, she scolded me in a hushed whisper. Velma is helping with the cooking and cleaning. One thing I knew to be true about my mother is that no one could cook or clean quite as well as her. At least, not as far as she's concerned anyway. But here my mother was with a maid. Either there was something very commendable about this picture, or something was very wrong. That evening after dinner, or supper as the people down south call it, I got to feeling a little nostalgic. Maybe it was me and Georgia sitting around the table with our parents. Of course Malibu was there too. But he didn't talk any more than my little brother Ryan used to. As a kid, my brother was quiet, having been overshadowed by three headstrong older sisters. Up in my room, I went to the window and slipped the curtain back, glancing outside. The sun had long since set, and darkness was on the verge of blanketing Cypress Falls. I saw a figure walking through the yard toward the back porch. Who was it? A man, for sure. He stilled yards away from the steps, but close enough for the porch light to cast a glow over his face. Mike Russell. What the hell was he doing here? Curiosity, or maybe nosiness, drove me to investigate. I trotted down the stairs, wondering if Risa had come in without hearing me. Why else would Mike be here? I stepped up the bottom stair, did a 180, while holding on to the ornate railing and peered down the hallway toward the back door, which was open. I could see Georgia standing on the back porch and Mike was still in the yard. They appeared to be talking. Huh? I took the long way around, through the living room, then the dining room, to get to a room, the parlor, that was close to the back door. I stayed in the corner, out of sight, trying to listen in, I wasn't in the habit of eavesdropping, 
but I couldn't imagine what Mike and Georgia had to talk about in those hushed voices they were using. I heard George say, I want you to sign over the dealership to Risa and Ryan. That ain't happening, Mike said in a strong yet quiet voice. Then you better be prepared for the fallout, she said. He told her, I'm not scared of you. She said, you should be, in a tone that I knew not to provoke. If you haven't done anything by now, you ain't going to, Mike said, like he thought Georgia was bluffing. The thing is, Georgia's not a gambler. She never bluffs. Don't push your luck, Mike, Georgia said in that warning tone of hers, the one that people who knew her paid attention to. You owe me, Georgia, Mike said. <clears throat> How do you figure, she said, almost laughing. You know what you did, he said with a snarl. She said, I know that Russell's Ford wouldn't exist without me. Huh? Now I was confused. What are you going to do? Mike snapped at her. Tell Risa, Lisa, the whole town. Mike let out a chilling laugh that rolled into the house and made me shudder. He said, You going to humiliate Lisa right before her wedding by embarrassing her father? It was a while before Georgia answered him with a sharp no. Then there was another long pause before I heard her say, You've managed that just fine, all on your own. Footsteps, then the screen door squeaked open. I pressed myself up against the wall, trying to get deeper into the corner. I couldn't see Georgia heading down the hallway, but I heard her footsteps. I also heard Mike, who was still outside, say, Stupid bitch, it'll be a cold day in hell before I turn the dealership over to anyone, including you. I stood there frozen, afraid to move. Whatever was going on between Georgia and Mike, I didn't want to get caught in the middle. That's how innocent bystanders get hurt. But that didn't stop me from wanting to know more. Hesitantly, I slinked out from behind the parlor door and peered through the screen to the porch. Mike was trekking across the yard, away from the house. I headed off to go find Georgia. She had the answers I was looking for. I climbed the back stairs, longing for the days when I'd run up and down them as a child. Now I truly understood what grown-ups had meant when they used to say to me, I wish I had a tenth of your energy. It took a lot longer now than when I was a kid, but I finally made it to Georgia's door. It was open, so I stopped in the doorway. She was standing over a bed, digging around in her purse. I said to her, Georgia. She stopped rooting and looked up at me, asking, Hey, Ginger, what's up? I hesitated a minute, wanting to make sure she cooled off enough to know the difference between going off on me and going off on Mike. I finally dredged up the courage to enter her room and said, We need to talk. She raised one perfectly sculpted eyebrow. Georgia had always been really good at that. Sculpting her eyebrows, I mean. Me, I'd always ignored mine. Thankfully, they weren't all that bushy. I asked, should I close the door? George shrugged. Okay, I said and went to the bed and sat down, leaving the door standing open. I asked, what's going on between you and Mike? Georgia dropped a purse on the bed and went to close the door, where she asked, you heard our conversation? She stood over me with one hand perched on her hip. I nodded. She said, Mom and Daddy? I said, No, I don't think so. She dragged her hair back out of her face, blew out a sigh, and sat down beside me. Remember when Mike opened up Russell's Ford? She asked, looking at me dead on. Who could forget that? I said, Yeah. Georgia continued, and Daddy said everybody wondered where he got the money. I nodded. There were rumors about a loan shark, I said. It was commonly known that Mike hadn't borrowed from any banks in town. I've been called a lot of things, Georgia said, but loan shark is a first. You, I said. I don't know why that never crossed my mind, I asked. 
how did that come about? I'll admit, I was a little shocked when he called me, George said, but the banks had all turned him down. I guess I was his last option. I asked, you gave him money to open the dealership? I wasn't having a hard time buying that Georgia was Mike's mysterious backer so much as I was at believing that he'd ask her for money in the first place. Mike's feelings for Georgia after all these years were no secret. I'm not sure hatred is a strong enough word. And to think of him crawling to Georgia for money, because that's how he'd view it, well, it was almost incomprehensible. Loaned, she corrected me. I loaned him money. Georgia gave me an eye roll, to which he's never paid back a single dime. The word, really, fell out of my mouth. My opinion of Mike, which had already suffered greatly over the past few months, dropped another notch on my scumbag meter. All these years, Georgia said, I've ignored the fact that he wasn't making the payments. I really didn't care, so long as Risa and Lisa were taken care of. And there was a job for Ryan any time he wanted it. George's voice was mostly calm, but inside, I knew she was stewing. I could tell because of those little infuriated looks that popped up on her face as she talked. She was trying to hide them, but I knew my twin sister too well. But now that Mike's left Risa, she said, as her face went cold, all bets are off. He's either going to sign the dealership over to Risa and Ryan, or I'm calling the loan. Chapter 3, Risa. One thing I, Risa Jane Franklin, pride myself on is being on time. But if there was ever a time to be late, I'd like it to be today. But there's too much to do to prepare for the wedding. Not to mention that Mama's insistent upon throwing a barbecue this afternoon. She wants to welcome Georgia home in style. She just doesn't get it, though. There ain't going to be too many open arms welcoming that traitor home. Except for maybe Tommy and my daughter Lisa. And they're probably the only ones Georgia cares about anyway. I drove along Cheney Road, wondering how Georgia had taken the change. Back in the day, there was nothing but farmhouses dotted along this road. Now, most of them were gone, replaced by stores, shops, various local businesses, and even a couple of strip malls. I hope it confuses the hell out of her, and so badly that she can't get her bearings. It would serve her right. After all, she left Cypress Falls without a second thought. And like a dummy, I stayed. So, here I am, 45 years old, with nothing but a bucket full of regrets. They say it's lonely at the top. Well, I can tell you from personal experience that it's lonelier when you realize the top was within your grasp, but you let it slip on by. Before I could get too deep in my wallowing, I arrived at my parents' house. I guided my car along the driveway and felt a knot twisting in my gut when I saw the fancy car, a BMW, parked out front. George is showing off, no doubt. I became painfully aware of my own car, a two-year-old sedan, and was instantly overcome with feelings of inferiority. I wanted to throw the car in reverse and head back home. It was tempting, really tempting. But Georgia had already taken enough away from me. I wasn't going to let her steal the front seat at my daughter's wedding, too. My latent, deeply buried self-esteem struggled to dig out from under the rubble of being second, maybe third at best. I pushed open the car door and rolled out, then grabbed the garment bag with Mama's dress from the back seat. My legs felt like they weighed 50 pounds apiece as I trudged up to the front door. I didn't want to go inside, didn't want to face Georgia, 
Didn't want to hear her say, I told you so. Stepping through the doorway, I heard laughter and someone pecking at the keys on the piano from in the parlor just down the hall to the left. I draped the garment bag over the staircase railing and crept down the hallway. I knew Georgia and Ginger were in there. I recognized their laughter, even Georgia's, after all these years. I paused outside the doorway and leaned against the wall, wanting to put off this reunion for as long as I possibly could. What's that they were pecking at on the piano? Chopsticks? Since when did Ginger play the piano? A small part of me resented that Georgia had obviously taught our sister how to play my part. I sucked down my resentment, pushed myself off the wall, stepped into the doorway, and stopped abruptly. Ginger wasn't sitting at the piano with Georgia. She was in a nearby chair with her legs draped over the arm. She was wearing her hair a honey blonde color these days, but that wasn't what concerned me. What concerned me was the man at the piano with Georgia, a man I didn't know. He was dressed nicely and looked fit underneath the blue silk shirt and black slacks that he was wearing. I should have known Georgia would bring home some eye candy to rub salt in the wound. Risa, Ginger said, tossing her legs over the arm of the chair and slamming her feet to the floor. She glanced toward the piano nervously then hopped up and rushed toward me, saying, It's so good to see you. She embraced me. You too. I hugged her back and couldn't help looking over her shoulder toward the piano. Georgia was up now, and so was her musical partner. He was even better looking from the front, with his dark hair and chilling blue eyes that were probably enhanced by the blue in his shirt. But really, who cared what made his eyes that color? He was younger, probably in his mid-thirties. Leave it to Georgia to rock the cradle. Risa, she came to my side, but made no attempt to embrace me, even after Ginger and I parted. She said, you look great. Georgia, I paused, giving her red hair a long once-over. Bold cherry. I had seen the damn box at the grocery store. Not that I thought Georgia was in the habit of doing her own hair, but it was basically the same color. I looked her square in the eye and said, Lisa will be happy that you're here. Is there anything I can do to help? She asked. I said, no, Georgia. I couldn't fight the urge to get in at least one jab. So I added, believe it or not, we in Cypress Falls have figured out how to get along without you. Ginger chuckled nervously and sidled up between us, saying, Risa, I want you to meet a friend of ours. She motioned toward Georgia's boy toy. This is Malibu Drake. Malibu, I thought. That can't be his real name. Ginger looked at him and said, Malibu, this is our sister Risa, mother of the bride. He stepped toward me with a grin tipping the corners of his mouth. Risa, he said. His sapphire eyes mesmerized me. He gently clasped my hand in his and drew it up to his lips and kissed it. Is this guy for real? He said, I've heard so much about you. I'm honored to finally meet you. He'd heard a lot about me? From who? And what exactly had he heard? I said, it's nice to meet you too, Malibu, in the friendliest voice I could manage over my pounding heart. What the hell was wrong with me? I was acting like a schoolgirl, but it did my heart good to see Georgia's California toy openly flirting with me. I'm right in front of her too. Take that, sis. I took Mama's dress upstairs to hang it in her closet. Her bedroom door was cracked open. I knocked gently, wondering if she was in there. More than once, I'd come over lately and found her napping in the middle of the day. If you knew my mama, you know what an unusual occurrence that is. Plus, 
She's been looking tired lately, and pale too. Mama wasn't in her room, but I could tell from the slightly wrinkled bed cover that she'd been there. It was only 11.30, and she'd already taken a nap this morning. This set worry deep in my gut. <clears throat> I've asked her twice if everything's okay. Both times she just smiled and said, Everything's fine, dear. I don't want you to worry. But I have a feeling everything's not okay. My mama bringing in higher help is a red flag if ever I saw one. I took the garbage back to the closet and went to go find Mama. I found her on the back porch, sitting in a rocking chair. For the first time in my life, my Mama looks aged and worn out. A woman in her early 60s shouldn't look so old. I said, Hey, Mama. I sat down in the chair next to her. I put your dress upstairs. Thank you, she said, and gave me a tired smile. Did you see your sisters? There was hope in her voice. Hope for a reconciliation between me and Georgia. I just don't know how to tell Mama that's not going to happen. I said, yes, Mama. And I'd best change the subject before she had me trapped in a guilt trip over Georgia. I said to her, are you feeling all right? You look a little tired. Are you sure this barbecue is a good idea? Good idea or not, it's happening, she shrugged. Then a smile spread over her washed out face as she added, Everybody will be here. It's just like old times. No, Mama, I thought, it's not like old times. Nothing will ever be like old times again. Georgia had seen to that. By mid-morning, my parents' place was alive with the hustle and bustle of deliveries of everything from tables and chairs to smoking gun, the best barbecue in town. Ginger and I were sitting on the back porch. I don't know where Mama had gone off to. I hadn't seen her in a while. Ginger asked, So, what's the deal with you and Mike? I bit my lip and waited a bit before answering. It was hard to go there. I said, your guess is good as mine. I was hoping that it'd appease her, but I knew it was wishful thinking. After a while, she said, he'll come back. I wasn't so sure who she was trying to convince, me or her. I shook my head saying, he's got a girlfriend. What? Ginger shot, shrieked out in her voice. Now that Ginger knew, it was only a matter of time before Georgia found out. I was sure she had a field day with that one. I couldn't say anything. I was holding my mouth together tightly to keep from bursting into tears. I only shook my head. Ginger asked, does she know Mike is married? I nodded. Ginger said, half seriously, you want me to have her taken out? Then she got serious at him. No, no. She raised a finger. Better yet, she added, let's take out Mike. Sometimes it's hard to tell if she's serious. When she gets pissed off, anything's possible. I said, you can't tell Georgia about this. Ginger looked at me like I was nuts. She asked, how long do you think you can hide it from her? The longer the better, I said. I really can't handle Georgia telling me I told you so right now. I sucked in a breath, honestly. I didn't know if I wanted to cry because of Mike or all those missed opportunities I'd wasted on him. Risa, Ginger said, Georgia would never say that to you. It really annoyed me that Ginger defended her. Just once, I'd like to see her be on my side. I said, that's easy for you to say. You two are thick as thieves. My remarks stopped Ginger for a second or two, then she said, as if it were the most natural thing in the world. So you want to join our club? What club, I asked, starting to get a little frustrated. Ginger chuckled, the Lonely Hearts Club. There was confidence in her words that made me wonder if this wasn't a bona fide club, she said. Now, 
Me and Georgia, we're bested members, you understand? She paused long enough to smile and added, but we've always got room for another lonely heart. Ginger started laughing then, and I'll admit it was a little deflating. For a minute there, I thought I might be accepted into their inner circle. But that was wishful thinking. I pushed myself up out of the chair to go see if Lisa and Ethan had arrived yet. Ginger was quick as a whip, jumping up and grabbing at my arm. She asked, did Mother make some punch? Yeah, I said with a nod, then glanced down at my arm. Ginger let go. I said, it wouldn't be a barbecue without Mama's punch. Ginger said, remember how we used to spike it? There was a giddiness in her eyes now. Yeah, I said. See, Mama used to make this punch when we were kids, and it tasted really great. When we were teens, we found a way to make it better, with a little rum or vodka, whatever booze we could get a hold of. Let's do it, Ginger nodded eagerly. Oh, come on, Ginger, I said. We're not kids anymore. All the more reason to spike the punch, she said. Let's have some fun. Chapter 4 Georgia. I idled my way down the stairs. I wasn't looking forward to the barbecue. Practically the whole town was supposed to be there. And I was pretty sure they'd all show up just to remind me about the injustice that I'd perpetrated upon the town. I don't know why the entire town took it so personally that I'd left the band behind. It wasn't like my decision affected any of them on a personal level. On the landing at the bottom of the stairs, I stopped. I could hear voices coming from the rooms attached to the hallway. Voices I didn't recognize. My best bet was to turn around and go back upstairs to hide in my room until the festivities had concluded and everybody had gone home. Just as I decided that hiding upstairs was a good idea, the front door opened. I could tell from the way the sunlight beamed down the hallway. Curiosity pushed me to peek around the corner to see who it was. Lisa and Ethan were silhouetted in the sunlight, looking like two angels holding hands. To Reese's dismay, Lisa looks more like me than she does her mother. And with Ethan standing there, holding my look-alike niece's hand, well, he was a carbon copy of his father. Oh, God. Before I could set my feet in motion to run back upstairs, Lisa saw me. Aunt Georgia, she said, letting go of Ethan's hand and ran to me. We hugged. She added, I'm so glad you're here. I said, are you kidding? I stepped back to look at her, still holding her hands. I added, I wouldn't miss this for the world. And I meant it, for the most part. There were parts I could do without like all the snarky comments and angry glares from people that I hardly even knew or didn't know at all. I could do without that. Ethan was beside us now, wearing a wide grin. Lisa pulled one of her hands free of mine and latched onto his. Still looking at me, she said, You haven't met my fiancé. Her smile beamed and her eyes sparkled. In Georgia, she said, This is Ethan Dixon. She glanced at him, adding, Ethan, this is my Aunt Georgia. Miss Franklin, his eyes brightened and his face flushed. He stuck his hand out at me and said, I'm honored to meet you. I shook his hand, saying, Ethan, it's a pleasure to meet you. Things were starting to look up. Clearly, Ethan Dixon did not hate me. And if anybody had a right to, he did. After all, as it turned out, I had unknowingly been the third person in his parents' marriage. Lisa asked, how long are you studying? I said, oh, not much past the wedding. I tried to laugh it off, but it was tough. I added, I don't want to wear out my welcome. Yet sadly, that was as easily done as said. A girl appeared from out of nowhere and grabbed Lisa. I've been looking for you, she said, pulling my niece away. I had no idea who she was, but I assumed she was one of Lisa's friends. Ethan was still grinning at me. 
I shrugged and said, Are you sure you want to get mixed up with this crazy family? We both laughed a little, but I'm sure he thought I was kidding. I wasn't. Not so much. When did you get in? He asked. I said, yesterday, not long enough to make me want to run away, but long enough to make me start to feel nervous. He looked at me like I was crazy and said, I can't imagine you being nervous. That's when I knew for sure that he was talking to Georgia Franklin, the superstar, not Lisa's Aunt Georgia. Only when I come to Cypress Falls, I shrugged, me in this town. We have a complicated past. Maybe it would be good for Ethan to know I was nervous, anxious even. It'd do him good to realize that the superstar was a real person, that she breaks just like everybody else. His expression softened, and I had high hopes that he was seeing me. He said, Miss Franklin. I said, please call me Georgia. All right, Georgia, he said. I know that you and my dad have a bond. He nodded as he spoke. I just want you to know I'm okay with that. I doubted his mother was. Thanks, Ethan, I said. I gave him a smile and touched his arm before asking, Is your dad coming today? He nodded again, saying, I saw him cutting through the side yard when Lisa and I arrived. I leaned toward Ethan and said, Just above a whisper, Listen, well, it's just you and me. If you and Lisa ever need anything, and I do mean anything, you just let me know. I put special emphasis on the word anything. I meant it literally, and I wanted Ethan to know that. Thank you, he said, like a proper gentleman. Lisa emerged from the parlor. Where's Aunt Ginger, she asked, and who's the California hottie y'all brought with you? She glanced at Ethan and winked. Malibu, I said, he's a friend. I think they're outside. We all started toward the back door. I remembered the chat I'd had out on the back porch with Mike last night and wondered if he had the guts to show up today. His time would be better spent finding a new backer. If he didn't believe I'd called alone, boy, was he in for a surprise. I pushed the screen door open and we stepped out onto the porch. Party guests were milling about the yard, many of them sitting at the tables that had been delivered this morning. Ginger and Risa were sitting on the porch. Ginger waved and Risa tossed me a glare that was filled with hatred. I knew if I started toward them, Risa would get up and leave. So I let Lisa and Ethan approach them while I descended the five steps that led down to the yard. It was full of people and I had no idea who any of them were. This was the house I'd grown up in, the place I'd spent my childhood. But this was not home anymore. I'd been gone for too long, and Cypress Falls had changed way too much. I glanced around at the crowd, wondering if I'd gone to school with any of these unrecognizable faces. And then I saw him, Tommy Dixon. He was chatting with a couple of people and he hadn't seen me yet. The boy I had once known had grown into a splendid man, tall and fit. His hair was intact, short and still a golden brown. But when the sunlight hit it just right, I could see the slight grain at his temples. My heart did a flip. Tommy glanced around and finally caught sight of me. He smiled and I could see remnants of the boy he'd once been in his face. With his eyes glued to me, he said a few words to his companions and then started toward me. I hadn't made a conscious effort to go to him, but I was doing it just the same. It's like my feet had a mind of their own. Either that, or I was being pulled to him like steel to a magnet. Georgia, he pulled me to him and I reverted straight back into a love-struck teenager. He said to me, you're a sight for sore eyes. I clung to him, enjoying the feel of the man he'd grown into. And I said, it's wonderful to see you again, Tommy. After what seemed like an eternity, I managed to pull myself back enough to look at him. I said, you look great. 
Red looks good on you, he said, then pushed a strand of my store-bought red hair back out of my face. His touch nearly made me sigh. He added, you haven't changed a bit. That's not true, I said candidly, but thanks for saying it just the same. Tommy, Ginger exclaimed. She had miraculously appeared at her side, effectively killing the mood. She smacked his arm at him. How the hell are you? Ginger, he said. It's good to see you. So, Ginger's eyes lit with excitement. I hadn't seen her this excited in a long time. Let's spike the punch like we used to, she nodded eagerly. I asked, is there any liquor in the house? Hell no, Ginger said, rolling her eyes. She looked at Tommy and asked, you got any booze? Tommy said, Ginger, and he gave her a hard look. You do realize that I'm a sheriff, right? There was humor in his voice, and it made me laugh inside. Ginger raised an eyebrow. Cypress Falls turned dry since I was last here. Tommy didn't say anything. Ginger stomped her foot. Where's your sense of adventure, she asked. Tell you what, Tommy said. How about George and I go to the liquor store, he added, and it was no question. Oh, Ginger said, that's a great idea. She looked at me and nodded. Go for a ride in Tommy's truck, I asked. How do you know he has a truck? I heard, she said, shrugging and turning away. Well, Tommy said, looking at me, I guess it's our job to get the booze. It had been a long time since I'd been in Tommy Dixon's truck. The one and only time it had been a junker, but I sure did enjoy it. This time, the truck was practically brand new and clearly marked with Cypress Falls Sheriff's Department emblem. Tommy opened the door for me. I didn't get in right away. Instead, I turned to him and said, Are you sure this is a good idea? He said, We're just going for a ride, Georgia. Tommy looked a little hurt. No, I said, I mean, should we be going to get booze in a sheriff's department vehicle? Where's your sense of adventure? He laughed. He took my elbow and coaxed me into the truck. It's okay, he said. I'm off duty. Chapter 5 Risa Georgia had strolled off with Tommy like the fox who'd raided the hen house. I know it shouldn't bug me, but the thought of Georgia getting her man after all these years, in addition to wealth and fame, well, it annoyed the hell out of me. I hadn't seen Mike all afternoon, not that I really cared or wanted him to show up, but considering that everything about today and the next few days was all about Lisa, our daughter, his absence annoyed me just as much as his presence would have. I went to the swing on the back porch and sat down. I used my feet to propel the swing back and forth as I took stock of how crappy my life had turned out. I had only one good thing, just one, to show for my entire adult life, Lisa. And that should have been sufficient, except she had her own life now. And I was left with nothing to do but twiddle my thumbs. Georgia's California toy came out of the house. Knowing that she'd gone off with Tommy, I kind of felt sorry for Malibu. I mean, really, he comes all this way with her, and she runs off with another man. He saw me and came toward me with a smile. Did that bet worked on any straight woman. He sat beside me on the swing, turned to me and said, Now why is a beautiful woman such as yourself sitting here all alone? I studied his face, trying to figure out his angle. I mean, this guy was incredibly gorgeous and so full of it. <clears throat> I might have been beautiful once, or at the very least pretty, but my looks, just like my youth, had faded years ago. Even so, he continued to stare at me and finally asked, Where's your husband? I was taken back. I wasn't sure what I could say, 
that would make me seem like less of a loser than I actually was. Finally, I found a place to begin and said, well, for starters, he's my soon-to-be ex-husband. So, knowing that, it'll probably make sense when I say I haven't a clue. Malibu's blue eyes sparkled as he gazed at me. Soon-to-be ex, huh? he asked, looking at me like I was the best thing since sliced bread. And I have to say, it felt good. What is it that you do out in California? I asked, halfway expecting him to say he was an actor. But he said, I'm an events planner. Clearly, he missed his calling. Like parties, I asked. I'll admit, there's not much of a call for that around here. He said, among other things. I asked, truly curious. What made you want to come down here for my daughter's wedding? I've heard so much about you, he said with a shrug. I jumped at the chance to meet the legend. The legend? What the hell had Georgia been saying about me? The legend of what? I asked skeptically, just to let him know I wasn't buying what he was selling. You, of course, he said with a gleam in his eye. I hear that you have a voice that's divinely beautiful. Any chance I'll get to hear you sing while I'm here? I swear the man had truly missed his calling. He was really pouring it on thick. He should have been an actor or a politician. I shook my head and let some ill-behaved laughter roll off my tongue. It's not likely, I said, then shrugged. But one can always hope. He looked at me for a long while before saying, I'll have to work on that while I'm here. Malibu was openly flirting with me, but I didn't want to be another notch on his Franklin sister's belt. I'd heard rumors over the years about him in Georgia, but you can't count on the press for the truth, so I figured it was best to get the answers straight from the horse's mouth. I said, which one of my sisters are you actually involved with? Malibu let out a hearty laugh. I dropped my head into my hands. Oh God, I said, not both of them. He said, neither. His single solemn word drew my gaze back up to meet his. He added, Georgia and Ginger are my friends. There are no benefits involved. Are you gay? I asked. That's the only other explanation. His laugh was not so boisterous this time. Now it had a bite to it as he exclaimed, Damn it, woman, I'm flirting with you. I said, It wouldn't be the first time. Now answer the question. He eyed me for a minute, then said, No. So you're not gay? I said just because I wanted him to confirm it. When he shook his head, I added, and you're telling me that you've never slept with either one of my sisters. Malibu's mouth dropped open. He asked, you get straight to it, don't you? But it wasn't really a question. I knew, and I'm sure that he knew, the difference between sleeping with and having sex with. It's a common known fact that you could have sex with someone without sleeping with them. I didn't want semantics to get in the way of his answer. Yeah, I said, and I'd like a straight answer. He looked a little disappointed and said, No, I've never had sex with either of your sisters. Like I said, we're just friends. I felt bad, so I said, Sorry if I was out of line. I hadn't meant to invade his privacy, and it bugged me that he seemed to be frustrated by it. But you've been flirting with me, I said. You admitted it, or was that a joke? His expression softened as he said, no, it wasn't a joke. He looked at me like he was undressing me. My heart thudded against my chest, reminding me that at least my ability to get laid was still alive. And then he said, you 
You're an incredibly beautiful woman, Risa. Of course I'm flirting with you. I felt like I was on candy camera or something. Things like this just didn't happen to me. Not anymore. A man ten years my junior flirting with me. I glanced up at the sky wondering if fate was playing some cruel joke on me. It was possible. Look what she'd done to my sisters.